thank you very much for coming out tonight. My name is John Kenyon, and I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature Organization. And I would like to welcome you to the 2021 Iowa City Book Festival. Thanks to those of, uh, of you who are joining us here in the room at the Iowa City Public Library, as well as to those who are uh, slowly migrating their way over to YouTube to watch us there. Uh, the event will also be recorded, so we'll be sharing uh, the link out tomorrow uh, for folks who were not able to catch it today. So I wanted to start by just thanking our sponsors, without whom uh, all that we do would not be possible. Uh, we have support coming from the City of Iowa City, from the University of Iowa, and from Iowa Public Radio. We also uh, want to thank our partners who help us to put on these events, uh, particularly the Iowa City Public Library, uh, where we hold many of our events. Uh, they house our office and have just been wonderful partners to us for well over a decade. Uh, we also would like to thank our friends at Prairie Lights. Uh, we have our friend Kathleen in the back who uh, has books from our authors and she would be happy to sell those. The more you buy, the less she has to take back to the store. So I'm sure she would love that. Um, and of course, I would like to thank our programming partners. And we uh, have had some wonderful partners over the years and continuing this year. Uh, and one of our best partners has been the International Writing Program at the University. Uh, from the very beginning of the festival, we have worked with the IWP on programming. Uh, and not just on programming, but uh, Chris and Hugh and Natasha and the entire team there have just been instrumental in helping us uh, to be a better organization and to really strengthen our ties internationally. So thanks to all of you. Uh, for what you have done. Uh, they also tonight bring you this program, and we're so very pleased to be able to partner with them on this. And so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Christopher Merrill, who is the director of the IWP, who will introduce tonight's program. Thank you, John. Uh, I must say all thanks to John who makes the Iowa City Book Festival such a magical event year after year. And tonight is a special event in the sense that it not only brings together one of our current fall residents, Habib Tangor, about whom more in a moment, but it brings back to IWP our very first uh, participant from Luxembourg, Pierre Joris. Uh, Pierre and I have known each other for quite some time. Uh, and it was Pierre who introduced me to Habib's work and uh, made possible this conversation about writing, about uh, translation, but most saliently about uh, the thematic poetics, the ways in which travelers give us a larger sense of the world. Habib Tangor is a poet, essayist, playwright, translator, scholar, an editor from Algeria. He has published more than 20 books, including his recent volume of poetry, Empetekali Sandal. I knew I would get that screwed up. His poetry has been translated into English, German, Italian, Arabic, and many other languages. He himself translates poetry from both Arabic and English. In 2016, his work garnered him a pre European to poesy. Dante. He directs the series Poème de Monde, Poems of the World, for the Algerian publisher APIC. And his participation in the IWP's fall residency has been made possible by the Paul and Welling Angle Memorial Fund. It occurred to me on the way over here tonight that when Pierre was here in 1987, that was actually the last year, the last official year that Paul and Welling Angle were uh, directing the program. Uh, he is, as his friend, colleague, translator, Pierre Joris, observes in his introduction to Exile is My Trade, a Habib Tangor reader, and as John noted, copies of, the, of which are available in the back. One of the Maghreb's most forceful and visionary poetic voices of the post-colonial era. He has forged uh, from his life between Algeria and France a nomadic poetics predicated on the ways in which exile and migration may be the most important facts of the modern world. The first line of his very first book published uh, half a century ago is, my name is Ulysses, I am 22, I study sociology because I flunked law. And the Republic of Letters is all the richer for it. 
Let's join me in welcoming Habib Tingul. to be here. So and I'm very happy to be here with my friend because we knew each other for a long time. We met, uh, I think, in 76 in Algeria, in Constantine. Uh, Pierre teaches uh, English literature and I was in the sociology department. And so our friendship began those Yes, and after that, yeah, uh, with Pierre, we had the, the, the same, you know, we, we liked the same poets and uh, African poets and North African poets, and uh, he initiated me to translation because he, he said, no, you have, you, want to, you have to translate, it's very important, and I said, well, but I don't know, that. I don't try, and yeah, it was a really good thing. So, with Pierre, uh, with the river, uh, it is in an anthology, and I am going to read some text, uh, short poems, maybe the long prose, are too, maybe you have no time, but I, I begin with the short poem. The first one, it's L'Arc et la Cicatrice, my first poems, yeah, the 70s. And I began with a part, Café Marine. Toutes les mers traversées, Calypso portait les ceintures lourdes, et le marin la regardait épouiller ses rêves. Pourquoi évoquer ce qui fut jour à la nostalgie Ulysse était Dieu auprès d'elle qui pleurait les florilèges oubliés. Un jour, le coquillage lui dit l'immortalité d'une odyssée et il demanda à rentrer. Calypso carried the heavy scent of all the seas crossed and the sailor watched as she deloused her dreams. Why bring up what were days of nostalgia? Ulysses was God for her, her who was weeping over forgotten garlands. One day, the seashell told him the immortality of an odyssey. He asked to go home. C'est dans un bar sans avenir qu'Ulysse engage ses compagnons à la rupture lourde de désir. Il commande la première tournée et il bure jusqu'à la fermeture. Ils se réveillèrent des jours amers au tragique tissage du conte où l'enchantement quotidien se révèle inutile à saisir la mélancolie innée des cercles. À la barre, Ulysse exhortait l'équipage à lester ses rêves au bleu hasardeux en finir avec la servitude du petit déjeuner. It's in the no future bar that Ulysses gets his companions to commit to the break heavy with desire. He orders the first round and they drank until closing time. They woke up bitter days at the tragic weaving of the tale where daily enchantment reveals itself useless at grasping the innate melancholy of circles. At the helm, Ulysses exhorted the crew to ballast their dreams with the hazardous blue. You have done with the servitude of breakfast. Je vous comblerai le regard dit Ulysse à ses compagnons et vous verrez. On courbera la lune à polir le tremblement des lèvres à l'émerveillement du miel de lavande et le spectacle enfantin de découverte à renommer dans le midi salé de nos doigts. Loin de la peine qui creuse le regard agile à se lier, loin de mourir, qu'attendre du voyage disent les compagnons. Et vingt années plus tard, Ulysse rentrait seul. Il se dirigea vers le café de la marine et, après avoir payé à boire à tout le monde, « Je vous comblerai le regard, » dit-il. « I'll gratify your gaze, » Ulysses tells his companions, « and you'll see, we bend down the moon to polish the lips trembling with the wonder of lavender honey. 
and the childish spectacle of discoveries to be renamed in our fingers' salty noon. Far from the hurt that hollows the gaze nimble at connecting, far from dying, what to expect from the journey, the companions ask. And 20 years later, Ulysses came home alone. He went straight to the Café de la Marine, and after paying for drinks all around, I'll gratify your gaze, he says. Another part of the book, Chaumou et Tol. Rayure, reste calciné, demeure vide de rêve. Tu épuisas le regard, le regard de toutes les places désignées, mourir le chemin. Comme la corde terrée, comme le galop qui a perdu la cadence, comme la hardiesse de l'eau, ou la halte redoutée, oubli des premiers pas. Que d'attente dans nos vies, là, sèche une vie nos soleils blancs, Là, mon corps s'était cassé au sol, que d'envie dans la tente aimée. Les jours imagine le sable déserté, parade. Grooves, calcinated remains, dwelling emptied of dreams. He exhausted the gaze of all the designated spaces to die the path like the rope gone to earth like the gallop that has lost its cadence, like the boldness of dawn, where the feet halt, oblivion of first steps. How many lulls in our lives, over there a vine dries in the white sun, over there my body had shattered on the ground, so much desire that a well-loved lull, the bees imagine the sand deserted, Parade. Mire offerte, sceptre déposé au jour qui se lève nu, tremblante rencontre. Nos vies se sont croisées pour se perdre à jamais. Pleurer le lieu aujourd'hui, mémoire mutilée. La peine maîtrise les mots. Tu te présentes avec une histoire rapiécée, une âme jaunie par le temps. Quel espoir tiens-tu dans le propos égaré À l'approche du soir, j'ai entendu les larmes et nos vies se sont regardées. Longtemps, la plaie suspendue comme un blâme. Offered myrrh, scepter laid down to the day that rises naked, trembling encounter. Our lives cross to lose themselves forever, to weep over the place today, mutilated memory, the pain masters the words. You present yourself with a patched up story, a soul yellowed by time. What hope do you hold in the words gone awry? As evening closed in, I heard the tears. Our lives looked at each other. For a long time, the wound suspended like a reprimand. Auteur Jaspé. Tu contemples le crépuscule au sortir d'un drame, miroir sans résonance, dénuement des effets. Ta vie heurte l'autre rive, ton âme hypothéquée. Tu dis, je n'ai pas voulu cela, mon visage, et tu dis, le destin sous le masque, une promesse arrachée. Elle, soucieuse, te regarde, et regarde, et te regarde. Regarde-toi. Au sortir d'un drame, miroir sans résonance. Marbled height. <coughs> you contemplate sunset at the close of a crisis. Mirror with no resonance, destitution of effects. Your life collides with the other shore, your mortgaged soul. You say, I didn't want that, my face. And you say, fate on that mask, a snatch. Promise. She, worried, looks at you and looks and looks. Look at yourself. At the close of a crisis, mirror with no resonance. And uh, the second collection, Gravité de l'Ange, 
some short poem also. Riva, uh, the part is le radio de la mémoire. Rivage. Tu scrutes sur le sable humecté, lumière et sel ensommeillée. Tu souris. Aux choses environnantes, tu te présentes vieilli dans l'île et le silence. La mer n'amorce nulle complicité et seul, tu baignes dans une évocation dite innocente. Le long voyage lointain dérisoire, l'art d'accoster oublié, brouillé tout repère, le rivage en cicatrice glisse l'intention d'un regard. Sure. On the dampened sand, you survey light and salt, drowsy. You smile to what surrounds you older. You present yourself on the island in the silence. The sea proposes no complicity, and you bathe alone in an evocation said to be innocent. The long voyage far away, derisory, the art of accosting forgotten, all reference points muddled up. From shore to scar, a gazes intention slides. Elle, nue, à fondre l'eau dans l'aube naissante, miroir immobile, dilaté, en exaltation, reconnaissance des heures passées, somptueuses et transparentes et bénies. Un mensonge prend autruche, une trame alourdie de remords, une fissure que tu observes s'élargir, s'emparer de ton sang en séance plénière. Passion de pièces rapiécées, liantes, puis engourdies, foyer lapidaire. La mer nous dégorgea de sagesse corrompue sur une rive d'algues goudronnées, nues tel un rêve, et l'aube bleue de brume s'attarde encore sur nos lèvres. She naked, cleaving the watery nascent dawn, immobile mirror dilated, An exaltation, recognition of the hours, spent, sumptuous, and transparent, and blessed. A lie, peacock, ostrich, a weft, weighed down with remorse. A fissure you observe growing wider, seizing your blood in plenary session. Passion for patched up pieces, affable, then numbed, lapidary, hearth. The sea disgorged us of corrupt wisdom on a shore of tarred algae, naked as in a dream, and blue dawn of fog still lingers on our lips. Brusquement, rien, et tu réapparais, ordonne de revivre au-delà. Que de mots couverts d'hermine, une taciturnité d'oiseaux nocturnes, le vêtement déchiré par simple atavisme. Vers l'île, par hasard, hébergement provisoire, captif et la planche à voile, à sortir presque mort de chez soi pour mourir seul et continuer là, dans l'île, comme si rien n'avait été, tu reviens exiger la rançon d'une vision, détruire une âme dévastée par ses voyages. Tu es mon domaine, mon lien, je m'installe chez moi et te délivre car j'ai appris à me tenir. Suddenly, Nothing, and you reappear, and command to relive, beyond so many words draped in ermine, the taciturnity of a night bird, the garment torn by simple atavism, toward the isle by chance, temporary accommodation, captive, and the sailboard, to leave home nearly dead, to die alone, and go on, There, on the island, as if nothing had happened, you return to demand the ransom of a vision, to destroy a soul devastated by its journeys. You are my domain, my link. I settle in at home and deliver you, for I have learned to behave myself. And now, an extract, an extract yeah, from a long poem, Ordeal to... Uh, Pierre translated also this uh, long poetry. Et maintenant un extrait d'un poème qui s'appelle Épreuve de. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
un, ensemble, euh, pardon, un semblant d'ordre régnait, mais la confusion s'installait dans notre dos. Quelqu'un agita la chemise froissée, pleine de taches rouges, devant une foule médusée. Il a évoqué l'âge et les mérites du défunt, rappelé la légitimité du lignage, requis le prix du sang. La catastrophe était inévitable. Elle disait « Ne suis-je pas votre mère à tous Comment pourrais-je privilégier un seul clan Mes yeux pleins d'affliction vous couvrent d'un même amour. Je ne cherche pas à vous induire en erreur. Je sais la révolte aujourd'hui salutaire. » Il disait « C'est bien vous que j'ai choisi pour me venir en aide, pour vous ?» J'entame un deuxième exil, mais l'effort exigé vous semble trop lourd. Savez-vous au moins ce que c'est qu'une attache Le chemin que l'amant parcourt dans le désert à chercher un regard de celle qui se dérobe. Comme je plains, vos cœurs sourds à ma sollicitude. Le jour s'est obscurci comme envahi par une nuée de sauterelle ou le vent de sable des confins de Hejaz. La température s'est alourdie. Ce n'était pas un phénomène rare dans pareil endroit. Il n'y eut pas de grande panique. J'ai seulement entendu une plainte. Qui défendra Koufa quand les gens de Koufa seront tous massacrés Qui défendra Basra lorsque ceux de Basra seront exterminés et les guerriers d'Égypte que l'inquiétude ronge Qui leur rendra la paix pour ouvrir le couchant et ce qui reste d'aide d'exilés à Médine, de seigneurs du Yémen ou de Bahreïn après la défaite du chameau Qui les réunira Il disait, j'ai toujours tué ceux que j'aimais. J'avoue avoir joui avec férocité, mais... Aujourd'hui, je m'en veux de ma précipitation. Je voulais te raconter une histoire, histoire de parler, de passer le temps, sans histoire, sans arrière-pensée, ni sous-entendu, sans souci du sens que les mots prennent quand on n'y prend pas garde, juste pour entendre dire comme bercer ou fredonner ou simplement se couler dans la courbure de l'air pour n'avoir pas aussi à me glisser dans la trame serrée d'un récit bien que j'ai raté mon coup, la guerre est bien là et les prémices de la discorde consignées dans des ouvrages qui ont défié les censures, à moins que ça ne soit une histoire à répétition, celle de l'éternel retour des désirs inavouables. Il n'a pas su dire exactement ce qu'il avait en tête, peur de se tromper de mots, comme si la parole restait rivée au lexique. En fait, il ne savait pas vraiment comment accrocher ton attention pour t'entraîner dans les méandres d'une histoire qui le taraudait depuis longtemps, l'empêchant d'accomplir son travail journalier et de dormir. Il a bredouillé je ne sais quel prétexte plausible, mécontent de la tournure que prenait la conversation. Tu refusais d'expliquer la situation, tu éprouvais des difficultés à parler, tu t'abritais en haut de ta tour d'ivoire, tu n'entendais pas les rumeurs de discorde et ne voyais rien venir de l'Est ni du Nord. A semblance of order reigned, but confusion was settling in behind our backs. Someone brandished the crumpled shirt full of red stains before a dumbfounded founded crowd. He evoked the age and the merits of the dead one recalled the legitimacy of the lineage, demanded the blood price. Catastrophe was inevitable. She said, am I not the mother of you all? How could I privilege one single clan? My eyes overflowing with affliction gaze at you with the same love. I do not try to induce you in error. I now revolt today, I know revolt today to be solitary. He said, It is you indeed whom I have chosen to come and help me. For you, I start a second exile. But the needed effort seems too heavy to you. Do you know at least what a tie is? The distance the lover covers in the desert to search out a glance of the one who hides. How I pity your heart, deaf to my solicitude. The day grew dark as if invaded by a cloud of locust or a sandstorm from the confines of the Hejaz. The temperature became heavier. 
This was not a rare phenomenon in such a place. There was no great panic. I only heard one complaint. Who will defend Kufa when the people of Kufa, when all are massacred? Who will defend Basra when all those of Basra are exterminated and the warriors of Egypt who are devoured by worries, who will give them peace to open the Occident, and what remains of aids and exiles in Medina, of lords of Yemen and of Bahrain after the defeat of the camel that will unite them. He said, I have always killed those I loved. I confess to have found a ferocious pleasure in it, but today my haste makes me angry at myself. I wanted to tell you a story in a way of talking, of spending time without worry, without reservation, nor in window, without worrying about the meaning words take on when you don't take care just to hear, say, like rocking or humming or simply slip into air's curvature so as not to have also to insert myself into the tight woof of the narrative. I do believe I screwed up the war is here indeed, and the premises of the discord are recorded in books that have defied to various censorships, unless the story is a story of repetition, namely the one of the eternal return of unavowable desires. He did not know how exactly to say what was on his mind, fear of picking the wrong words as if speech remained stuck to the vocabulary. In fact, he didn't really know how to catch and keep your attention and drag you into the meanders of a story that had anguished him for a long time, keeping him from accomplishing his daily tasks and from sleeping. He stuttered, I know not what plausible pretext, discontent with the direction the conversation was taking. You refused to explain the situation. You had difficulties talking. You took shelter at the top of the ivory tower. You didn't hear the rumors of discord and saw nothing coming from the east or from the north. You stop here or we continue? <laughs> Your turn. Mon tour. I don't know. Oui, on reprend après. OK, on va voir. Bon, euh, euh, je peux commencer par traduire, euh, lire en français les poèmes euh, que j'ai traduits et Pierre lira le poème en anglais. J'ai traduit et j'ai fait publier dans la collection Poèmes du Monde euh, un recueil, euh, enfin pas le recueil en entier, le recueil c'est les 40 stations, euh, les méditations d'Al-Hallaj. Il y a 40 stations et là j'en ai traduit 20. Ah, ah, ah. You know, the book for... That's okay, no, 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 it's, it's okay. okay. It's, um, it's okay. The book has been translated. You'll read a, a it's little about section of... Halaj is a Sufi a mystic in Islam and a very well-known mystic. He was crucified because uh, he was considered a, a, as a heretic. Ana al haq Yeah. Manners. Adab. Adab. Ah, manier. <laughs> oui. <laughs> manière. C'est quoi cette manière, je veux dire matière, que tu affiches debout là dans le désert Sors tes mains des poches. Le désert n'a pas de manière mais beaucoup de poches. Cela n'excuse pas ton manque de savoir-faire quand il s'agit de partager cette dernière pincée de sable chaud et mica filoche cachée dans les poches de ton cœur. Chris, did you want to say something? One, manners, a dub. What is the manner, I mean the matter, with you standing there in the desert? Take your hands out of your pockets. The desert has no manners but many pockets, which is no excuse for your lack of know-how when it comes to sharing this last pinch of hot sand that mica hides as lint in the pockets of your heart. Crainte, Rahab. La crainte est dans l'ébahissement quand tu le vois, 
Il t'effraie là où il est le non visible, dont tu sembles vouloir prendre soin, quand bien même cela te la sert d'affronter la crainte qui n'est pas dans la chose, ni la chose même, mais entre les deux. Il est la relation, un « nous » possible. Wonder. Four. Ah, c'est ces rache. Hein. Non, 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 mais c'est. Yeah, mais... Non, non, la crainte. Oh. Ah, voilà, oh. yeah, yeah. Oh, two. Oh. Rahab. The oh is in gawking. When you see it, it scares you. When it's the unseen, you seem to want to care. For even though it scares you to face the all that is not in the thing or the it, but between the two, it's the relation we can be. Can be. Hello. Translated excellently. Recherche. It's a set because uh, the, the text was. Uh, Serrage, serrage, and not search. Oui, vas-y, explique. Uh, I took the first, the 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 uh, uh, Halaj's 40 statements from the internet, and one of them was misspelled. It was meant to be search, but it was serrage. But so I kept it. That became kind of the into the poem. So. Yeah, and uh, I did the mistake in my translation. Recherche. Then it's not a mystery. <laughs> Il y a confusion à l'intérieur d'une époque. Les termes sont demandes sur la table. Que sera, sera. Les étiquettes scélérates sont très demandées. Résignation équivaut recherche, désir. Examine tes mots pour le con de la fusion. Fais ressortir les lettres même si elles frissonnent. Ce sont contes de neige, cette aube. Les mots, comme les palmiers, sont en grande demande. Abandonne. De, quand on jouit des privilèges que des symboles, la démonstration est recherche et la négligée est résignation. Cela équivaut au même, car la recherche est un principe qu'on ne doit pas négliger. L'impuissance est l'anéantissement de la faculté de recherche. For Siraj, tell us. There is confusion inside an era. The terms are demands on the table. Que sera, sera. Arch labels reach high demands. Resignation no better than search. Desire, search your words for the con of fusion. Make letters stand out even if they shiver. It is, snow it is snow tales, this dawn. Words like palm trees are in high demand. Desist. Two, whenever one enjoys favor, all actions, so many tokens. Demonstration is search, and his neglect thereof is resignation. No better than search, for search is a principle cannot be neglected. Impotence is the annihilation of the faculty of search. Khalas. You want to do a little intro as yep. a remote? OK. Yeah. And before the introduction, just wanted to uh, say that um, we'll have a Q&A afterwards. And for those watching from home, feel free to drop questions into the chat. Uh, I think we can read them on both Zoom and YouTube, but I'm hoping everybody is on YouTube now. As I said, Pierre Joris, who was in the IWP in 1987, has since moved between Europe, the US, and North Africa, publishing more than 80 books of poetry, essays, translations, and anthologies, including Fox Trails, Tales and Trots, Poems and Proses, the last volume, this is just in the last four years, the last volume of his translations of Paul Ceylon, Memory Rose into Threshold Speech, a 53 or 54 year long engagement with uh, that 
most uh, enigmatic and important German poet, a book of essays, uh, Arabia Not So Deserta, and conversations in the Pyrenees with the Syrian poet Adonis, all in the last three years, <clears throat> as I said. He and Habib co-edited the indispensable University of California book of North African literature. That's the fourth volume in the Poems for the Millennium series. And when he's not on the road, he lives in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, with his wife, the performance artist Nicole Perafit, with whom he published in 2017, The Book of You. The thing I also want to say is that when, uh, Pierre told me that when he came here at the age of 21, intending to learn to write in English his fourth language, the poet he chose to translate was Paul Ceylon, the most difficult poet of all. And that gives you a sense of the the range of his reference, his uh, curiosity about the whole of the rest of the world, and all of which informs the most dazzling poems that I know of our time. Pierre. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. We can talk more of translation later on, because I also translated Kerouac into French. <laughs> anyway, I'll read some poems from a yet unpublished volume I keep writing. I should retire, but no. Uh, a book called Interglacial. And by chance, if such a thing exists, the opening poem in uh, the opening book, which is called Loose and Found, uh, is called Elegy for Anselm. And that is Anselm Hollow, who was also somebody who taught here at, in the writing uh, department at the University of Hawaii. A great a brother, a true brother, because he's a Finnish poet who came to America and became an American poet writing in English. So we are really blood brothers from way back, and Anselm passed uh, about eight years ago. Uh, Elegy for Anselm, one. Eyes, eyes. Eyes, invisible the eyes, a thousand crows on the snow, and yet two crows already make a crowd. Two, and yet we have to travel and so on because there are wines that don't. Three, ich trinke aus zwei Gläsern as we both suck on at the royal caesura, the wandering eyes in the crow's nest between poem and translation, translation and poem, bringing it all back home. Uh, a bit further on, that feeling you can't go on it alone, the vagrant, vagabond. Give me a V sign, double it to go wandering. Leave the medulla, slip between pyramid and peduncle. The letters go backwards, from jugular to carotid, down, down, afferent all the way, to count the schlep, the schlep of viscera, lest you know how your gut gets its gut feeling. in praise of aging. The older you get, the taller you get. As you stand on the shoulders of your accumulating years, you see farther each passing year. Just don't turn around. Don't try to wash your ass. Don't fall down. So this is nearly a random gone through this, this thing, but you know, it will give a number of moods. Minutes before breakfast with Mohammed Benis at the Hotel Zelis in Asila, writing outside, looking at harbor and beach, here sun and air dry the ink as fast as I can trace the words, as far as the eye can see, sea meets land and lands its waves, spermatically white, spill over flat, prostrate sand, an islandology meets a nomadology, here where Sidi Akbar danced his horse into Atlantic waves, 
not yet foresee America, that other shore, Mira, Maghreb, West, this West, same waves, like same reversal with different distortions. Mohammed wrote from Paris last week. He's in Paris right now. Poets are nomadic by nature. My same poet may not be Tillon, who is a daddy, but is a poet of the pre-Islamic period. So, Tarafa. Tarafa. Ibn Tarafa is my, is my <laughs> Sudanese saying, one of the non-bourgeois of Calais on one of the last days of the great emptying, i.e. the shameless hiding of the eyesore Calais refugee camps called the jungle, where jungle is a translation from Pashto of Tsangal, meaning forest. One of those non-bourgeois of Calais reported a Sudanese saying to object to their, the refugees, dispersal, a saying that says solidarity alleviates pain. And this is how it goes. If we all die together, death is a feast. Refugees have been dispersed, but there are camps still around Calais. There are, you know, past 100 people back in New York. Marasma redirects to Knafalo Crocus, which eventually lands me on the Gunnus medinalis, the rice leaf roller, a species of moth of the Crambide family found in Southeast Asia. If you know more, check Wikipedia. I'm sending you there as I have to go out now to make sure the blue of the sky is still holding up those beech trees and the others whose names I don't know and who may therefore be standing up on their own or possibly under different names as it is only what we can name that we can knock down. Why do you think those people painted all those animals in the caves of prehistory? It was a school, not a pit or shaft, and the little ones didn't giggle as ours would, pointing to the dots, naming the rhino turds, but all together in their languages made up, that is, intoned, the names of the animals we now call lion, bison, bear, shaman, and whom we have now not only named, but called so often and killed when they came, that there is nothing or nearly nothing left, and the children of our children will have to relearn the names of the stones or whatever else may be left. <laughs> In the dark days of summer, Three of them. One, thinking in Europe begins, so suggests Pascal Quignard in his Mourir de Pensée, with Argos, Odysseus's dog. Go see the Odyssey, chapter 17, line 301. Enosen Odyssea Egus Eonta translates word by word as he sought Odysseus in him, who moved towards him, too. Which makes me think, on lines by Habib Tangour, I translated the dog's age ago, and we read, Homer will say that nobody recognized him, Ulysses, except the old dog. But dogs don't live long enough to recognize their masters. Three, riding the subway this morning, 
this. The baseball cap on the end train. In dog years, the dead. In red, on pink cap of a very alive Indian lady in her 30s. A little manifesto. I like my manifestos very short. The poet's job. Pick up everything that shines. Discard the gold. Keep the light. Uh, a bit of a longer narrative. We're doing good? Yeah, We're doing yeah, good? Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> a three-minute composition a la mode Dalashinsky to celebrate Steve. Steve Dalashinsky was an American poet, New Yorker, a complete, the classic New York Jewish kid, neurotic like no one's business, living off jazz all his life, Uh, selling books in the street to make a living, superb poet, uh, worked with jazz people all his life, and he passed. He was a close friend. He's married to a wonderful Japanese poet, so they were an amazing couple. Uh, and um, uh, it was so much fun when we moved to New York, and actually Nicole had been there before and uh, met, uh, met them, and uh, Steve showed Nicole the jazz sites, which we loved very much. So, so I wrote for a celebration uh, of uh, Steve Dalashinsky a couple of months after his passing. A three-minute composition a la mode Dalashinsky to celebrate Steve. And when I crossed the street, St. Mark's, it was from Puerto Rico imports to the northeast corner of uh, Second and St. Mark's, I thought I should go sit on the terrace of the Dallas barbecue to write this poem to you, Steve-O, to celebrate your days and nights in New York, as New York, as incarnation, as New York is incarnation, uh, or you are incarnation, of, to celebrate your days and nights that is your life here, as I remember an occasion when I crossed this street, St. Mark's, where by all rights, I should have run into you back when, 69, 70, 71, but didn't, or we did, but didn't know who we were, too stoned maybe, to look out, stuck inside, not only the big shitty, but our own young selves, selvas oscuras, if you permit me to quote that obscure Italian Dante in the East Village psycho delicatessen's jungle under growth and ground, and right here I was again, I'm again coming from Puerto Rico imports with my twice one and a half pound coffee beans under arm and crossing over to the northeast corner of Second and St. Mark's on a late summer, early evening, and I didn't think of going to sit down in the Dallas B barbecue terrace because for the nth time I wondered what a fuck a Texican barbecue was doing in the East Village on that hallowed corner just across Gem Spars where back when when was now and we'd run into Ginzi picking up his just delivered copy of tomorrow's New York Times and anyway that time the terrace was clearly full no place for me, every chair taken, and on two of them around a small table laden with food, there was you and Yuko absorbed and digging in with visible pleasure so neither sun nor hunger nor napkin could wipe away that slight smirk of skepticism played around your mouth from birth. You hadn't seen me yet, so I took out my phone, shifted coffee bags on the left arm and snapped you and Yuko eating. See, here is the photo. I'm not making this up. Then you saw and said, hi, Bob. And I said, Steve-o, jolly -o. got to boogie to a reading. You said, go, man, go, say hello to the lady. Maybe I'll see you later. Ha have two other gigs I need to catch first. And when I crossed that street again in the first line of this poem, my friend, it was cold and wintry, and all the tables and chairs were empty. I thought of sitting down to write this poem, but there was no music to cut the cold, and so I moseyed on till nights later, I mean, like tonight, I came kind of natural, took out pen and notebook, 
just as Joel and Faye started to play here at the Zresha with Yuko a few chairs away and Nicole sketching in the back and you not quetching by my side, but here, yes, here, here to hear, here to be here, that music, here, lend me your ear, Stevo, Stevo, Dalla, Dalla, Mensch, I miss you so. That is followed by a long elegy for my friend Louise Walsh, who passed also. Friends keep passing. During a Zoom reading by Jerome Rothenberg, 2,000 run of the mill Buddhas tread water. There were, there were no mirrors anywhere in the world, only others. In several parts, the whole is and is not. The whole is and is not in separate parts. In acts of cruelty, the present is miscarried again and again. Time, you say, is a bullfight. I say time is kneeling in the sand hour facing the bull. So in the last dream, Derrida comes down the majestic red carpeted staircase just before day breaks and with a large smile and, and an even more expansive wave of his left arm, the other rests on the baluster, gives the order for the gerrymandering to begin or to end. I can't be sure now this, how this one links to the long black and white dream just before only a quick piece separates them, in which I talk lengthily to various politicians and a few pundits, me included, it seems, about the evil of gerrymandering, and we are all absolutely certain, as certain as one can only be in a dream, that our lives depend on ending that terrifying trend. And now that I woke up for good, I would really like to go back into the last one and ask Jack if his gesture meant to begin or to end what the dream proposed. But I can't, I can't. The sun has risen behind me where I can't see it, but I do see its reflection in front of me, reddening the East Coast buildup west of here and on Staten Island just across the Verrazano Straits. It's quieter today, these waters, not half as royal as yesterday, or as my dreams may be today. Thank you. The reading. Uh, for people in this audience, uh, if you want to ask a question, John will have a mic, so uh, we'll use the mic so that the people on Zoom or YouTube can hear the question. Anybody? Yeah, right here. And I will say, <clears throat> I think I'm on. We didn't have any questions yet on YouTube, but we did have a, a lot of praise, so you have to go back and look through the chat to see all the nice things folks have said about you. Hi, hello. Um, actually, I have this question regarding the Al Halad uh, poem you've written. Um, because, you know, Al Halad is a very argumental you know, personality through the history, especially the Arabic history. And I feel that because he's killed, because before, like, he completing what he was wanting to say to the end, uh, he's been an aspirational personality for a lot of people um, to write what he wanted to say. There is this, you know, famous um, a poetry play, which is, has been written by the Egyptian uh, poet, uh, Salah Abdul Sabur, which is called, um, I think, Al Halaj. And um, I want to ask you, when, when you were working on this project, what did you feel that there is missing about Al Halaj that he not, like, have been seen, uh, said yet? that made you to complete his, you know, what he wanted to say? Well, clearly in the West here, you know, Al-Alaj is not that well known, except for some people who are interested in Sufi 
uh, work and so on. So you, if you read Henri Corbin or if you know, you know some of those people, Massignon, of course, did the big books on him. Uh, I have always enjoyed uh, and been very involved. I was more involved with Ibn Arabi for many years, you know, reading and thinking and, you know. And then uh, this, it so happened, two things happened. My sudden very deep interest uh, in, in Mosul al-Halaj coincided with America starting the Gulf War. And I wanted to write an anti-war poem to stop the war. And I decided to conjure the spirit of al-Halaj in those 40 poems, uh, uh, taking his 40 words, his 40, his 40 meditation terms, and writing a poem underneath them in an effort to write, in, if you want, against the war, without it being like stop the war type poem, as we did during the Vietnam War days. Uh, of course, the war kept going lo longer, and what uh, you can see that in the poem, in that the, the later sections of the poem become much longer. I couldn't stop, you know. Uh, uh, I went all the way in the 40th section, actually, was uh, at the end when um, uh, uh, that one is not here, right? This is only the first 20. I know, Alila? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bedaya. Yeah, yeah. The end one is called uh, Bedaya, the end, you know, which is also the end is in the beginning, and the beginning is in the end, and it goes on and it plays on a famous song uh, that, uh, uh, you know, is an American song, uh, uh, Begin the Begin, uh, and I play with that. So that was a long song to kind of celebrate the fact that that war was coming to an end. So if you want, my thinking was my own thinking about Laj and the deep interest that that man and his thinking, that famous line, Ana al uh, which is simply says, I would say that is the same vision of the deity that somebody like Spinoza has. He's all over. That's it. You know, I'm it. It is there. There's no need to create uh, some outside authority in that sense. Uh, and so that certainly was, was core to the thinking in it. Then seeing the horror of that war, you know, connected with the horror of all extremism coming from wherever it comes from. Uh, also, uh, I was interested by El Halaj. Because, uh, you know, his vision is not uh, the vision of the doctors of law, Fuqaha. Yeah. It's different. And what interests me is his poetry. He has a very strong poetry with images, interesting images. And uh, when I was young, I, I don't knew uh, al halaj I knew only... Uh, popular mystic in Algeria. I, I grew up in a city with uh, many, many uh, saints and many uh, uh, Sufi, but popular. Uh, and also their poetry was a popular poetry, not uh, the classical one of Bistami, al Hallaj. I, I knew them after when I was in France because there was a uh, Mood one in the 70s, many uh, writers, Maghrebian writers, and also I think Arabian writers, were interested in the Sufism because of uh, the way how they uh, manage the language. Tawasim, Tawasim, Halaj is very interesting to read and very complicated. You can't understand without illumination. And it is how to, to read the words and how to be illuminated by the world, which is interesting. It's a poetics uh, that interests yeah. us yeah, yeah. today in a very contemporary, you know, poetic. Poetic. Uh, Janabi. Well, when I, I, I met Janabi or uh, Adonis, Shawqi, Abdul Amin, 
So we spoke about also uh, Madab, also Madab uh, translated Bistami in French. You know, because Madab, differently, because Algerian uh, poets or Algerian writers, we had not uh, the classical culture, but we have the popular culture, and you can find the mystic in the right Katab Yassin or Muhammad, but it is only with the popular uh, connection, you know. But uh, in Morocco, little, yeah, but in Tunisia, uh, Madab has uh, uh, the, how to say, uh, the in different Tunisia, education, Islam, yeah, yeah, uh, Arabic education, and uh, in Islam also, uh, he, he had Ibn uh, Arabi, and, but I saw one, I, I, I mean, because Ibn Arabi is very difficult to, to read, and uh, Madab thought always the Algerian, you don't know anything about uh, this, and I invited him in a, 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 a seminar, a conference, about Ibn Arabi in Oran. Oran is the city near mine, Mr. Ghanem. So many uh, people, old people, uh, 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 you know, yeah, just in the uh, Arabic dress and I come, do, uh, who are they? I say, but they are in, uh, how do you say, confrérie, the brotherhood. Yeah. The Sufi brotherhood. Sufi yeah. brotherhood. And they know, how do they know Ibn Arabi? But I say, you uh, remember Ibn Arabi? Our big uh, author, Emir Abdel Qadr, Abdel Qadr, who fight against uh, French colonize, he, uh, how to say, he uh, discussed Ibn Arabi and he uh, uh, commented Ibn Arabi in his book, Kitab al Muwaqif. And I, 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 I told him, you know, in those brotherhood people, they are maybe, yeah, with the popular culture, but they read also and try to understand Ibn Arabi. Now, it is fascinating what I wanted to say. That somebody he mentions there, uh, our uh, good friend, the, the Tunisian uh, poet, Abdul Wahab Madeb. Uh, for the English speakers here, there is a book I translated of him. Uh, still available, uh, and it is called The Malady of Islam. And it was the essay that uh, Abdul Hub wrote uh, right after the 9 11 disasters, and that um, I, uh, we were very good friends, didn't have as many contention as the Algerian and Tunisians had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I translated it as he was writing it to get it out here because I thought it was essential to um, to do in relation to that whole um, uh, you know knocking down of anything Arab in this country after 9/11. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that book, uh, the Melody of Islam, is still available. In, in, he's one of he is one of our generations. Mm -hmm. I think one of the superb essayists out of the Maghreb and, and poet and you know that his first book is also which is very good is also available in uh, Talismano. Uh, Talismano. Yeah, yeah the, uh, it's not exactly a question but uh, uh, they would love to hear more about Habib's reworking of culturally specific material in his poetry that's a question I think that both Habib and Pierre might address. Uh, how do you how do you rework partic culturally particular material into to write art? what I is it, is it like just in general? Why, why does he go to the Odyssey? Why is he rewriting yeah. the Odyssey all the time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> the, the Odyssey because translate no, uh, uh, yeah because uh, uh, when I was uh, seven. Yeah. Seven years, uh, film. Uh, we saw the film uh, of Camerini, Ulysse, 
with Kirk uh, Douglas and Anthony Quinn, Silvana Mangano, and I was in love Silvana Mangano. Yes, <laughs> and I wrote many things because she, the perfect woman from one, ah, Silvana Mangano. And I, I wrote many because, yeah, uh, during uh, when I grew up in France, for me, Ulysses, it was the return to the, the native land, to the, the yeah, uh, yeah, to, to return to uh, the land, and it was uh, the thinking of the migrant, Algerian migrant, those times in the 70s, 60s, they thought, yeah, we are just here for a moment, and we return in our country. They didn't return. Uh, but I, I grew up with this... Uh, mentality to return. And I returned, yeah. I, I returned when I was uh, 25 in Algeria to do my military service, and I worked uh, five years in Algeria. But all my imagination, all the uh, what I had, uh, for example, for uh, Sultan Galier, I, I, I had big material about uh, uh, Marxism, uh, movement, uh, Bolshevik movement, uh, and uh, I wrote about one Bolshevik Islam, Muslim, uh, Islamic Bolshevik, Sultan Galiev, and uh, he was, uh, was not killed, but he was put in jail he, uh, by Stalin, and he disappeared. I don't know. And this, I. Uh, when I uh, have to write I, uh, all the, this material, I uh, work with this material as poet, not as uh, academic. And but I need to to have uh, precise uh, knowledge about what I am writing. And uh, yeah, and uh, also with my uh, job. Anthropology. I did many uh, survey in uh, land in Algeria. And after that, in uh, France, in the suburb, young people, and also after that, with the uh, old people. Well, uh, because now I, I, I work. Uh, at, when, before I retired, I worked about uh, old migrant, how to live exile. How Algerian or Maghrebian uh, migrant lived the exile in France. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful book. Yeah, you and I wrote uh, long poetry, and I worked with a photographer, and we did uh, a book. But uh, besides us, I also uh, wrote, uh, but just how to say, uh, paper, paper for. Academic papers, no, academic, and, yes, yeah, and yes, so on, yes, on that, so on that material. Because course. I was uh, in the university. Yeah. Okay, was your job? I can, yeah, I can, my job. I can do a little take, my take on, on, on Ulysses, because I have a slightly different take. I, I love that movie, too. It's, we saw, <laughs> being at the same age, I saw that movie as a kid, too. But in an essay I wrote, uh, it came out recently, I'm afraid all of a sudden that I, I, I dream of myself as a kind of modern, mo, mo, modern Odysseus returning to Ithaca. So I had a dream where I'm going to Ithaca, and I realized, no, it's Ithaca, uh, Cabisca, New York. So it must be that's And I really don't want to do that. I write, no way, Jose, as we say in New York. I have never been very fond of that founding story of the Greco-European culture even though I enjoyed and learned some of it from its Latin retitled rewrite by one man called Joyce in the early 20th century. I have, in fact, at the time lambasted it as the first bourgeois novel, telling the unbelievable and unbelievably macho tale of a warrior who, after much slaughter of innocent victims, delayed going home to his quietly and faithfully waiting wife because too busy drinking, carousing, and philandering with various ladies along the road. The gods in the story, Poseidon made me do it, are always a good excuse. Here and everywhere else they show up. I mean, we make them up and then have 
them show up to give us an excuse, right? Um, so, <laughs> of course, the fascination with, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with Ulysses, Odysseus, Ulysses, he, Odysseus, I, is there and remains. We translate him differently. The poem I, uh, I read uh, about Odil, uh, I was, uh, I read this text in the 90s, and it was the civil war in Algeria, and how to talk, uh, yeah, about this, about the civil war. I, I, I was thinking about uh, the moment after the death of the prophet and the third, the fourth caliph Ali, want to be caliph, and the third was killed by uh, Muslims, and they uh, say Ali is uh, the caliph. And the, it was the first dissension, how to say dissension? Dissension. Dissension yeah. in the community. Okay. And they were uh, fighting uh, those who wanted Ali, those who wanted the revenge the death of uh, Atman the third, those who were with the wife of the prophet, uh, a companion prophet, but he was, and all those with uh, different interests were in conflict. Mm -hmm. And to read the, the poem, I have, you know, just many voices. She said, he said, said and all, uh, you, you can do, you can, just know this history, but you have to, when you hear the poem, you have to, yeah, to, to feel that there is a problem in, in, in the situation between many voices are here speaking, we want this, we want this, and uh, the, the problem is we were in the, the civil war. By the way, if I can say one more thing about Ulysses, I may, be, may have just been bitching about him and what he did. Habib actually went, and his last book I have roughly is The Odyssey, yeah, yeah. where he writes the poems about all the women in the Odyssey, having the women speak out. Uh, so mm. that's, and yeah, it may be translated eventually. Always, but, yeah, your, your poetry is a man poetry. And I said, well, now Ulysses, Ulysses, I is not, I want the woman, Calypso, <laughs> Penelope, Circe, and how they think, how they see this, uh, Odysseus, Ulysses. And uh, it is not, uh, not a good image. <laughs> <laughs> but you've touched on translation, and I'm glad that Pierre uh, invoked and some hollow. Uh, maybe the two of you could talk about the ways in which you're translating practices have informed your poetics and vice versa. How the, how translation has shaped your lives. When I put up the little note of this reading on Facebook this morning, you know, added a line on top, I say, and we'll talk about writing as translation and translation as writing. Okay. In the mm -hmm. sense that more and more I find, and you may not contradict me or you may, but they're the same, you know, <laughs> that translating and writing are the same because language already is a translation. Mm -hmm. So all writing is translation of some mode and order. And it's only if you claim that there is some absolute language, you know, and that then you translate from that, uh, and you couldn't translate into that anyway, as, you know, uh, people do sometimes think, of the Quran mm -hmm. or of holy books, you know, because they, they, they would be existing mm -hmm. only in, you know, in that world. No, all language is a translation, mm -hmm. and therefore all language has to be translated further and so on. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and also uh, when you translate, you have to understand the language of another, but you have also to find your language and how, with your language, how the translation. Uh, modif modif modifies, modifies your, your, your own language to be another language. And so uh, it's what interests me. Because also when uh, uh, you translate the poetry, you can see if uh, the structure works or not. Mm -hmm. 
if it's a bad poem, it doesn't work. And so if it's a good poem, you have to write it in your own language and to find maybe new words, maybe, and it's what uh, is interesting. And uh, what uh, Pierre said, uh, it is new writing. Translating is new writing. Mm -hmm. And we all write with all these languages in our heads, you know. I mean, I can nearly hear in Habib's writing the Algerian Arabic underneath it that plays, you know, that, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that is there. And I'm sure, you know, somewhere the, my Luxembourgish, Germanic, and French languages are, you know, somehow hearable. I sometimes bring it out very consciously in the writing so that I write, I bring other languages in. I always used to tell my students, the easy way for me to go on in a poem when I'm stuck mm -hmm. is to take a line in Luxembourgish and translate it literally, and that usually makes a pun, and then I can move on, you know, and it helps me move mm -hmm. on so that Translation and writing, there, you know, they're simply the same process, and they keep, but the pleasure is the more languages you have, um, the better it is. And, you know, here there are a lot of people who have a number of languages. That old monocultural language thing uh, is uh, not global, by the way. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was basically the old colonial powers who believed in mono, you know, in monolingual uh, absoluteness. You know, the French, of course, French language is, of course, the best language in the world. The English thought we are always the most powerful language, you know. And then the Spanish, they conquered which world, so they're Spanish. Those were the languages that were mo most resistant to notions of poly linguistic processes. And I used to tell my students at American universities, you know, I've never come across an African who didn't know four or five languages because that's how you taught, how you know, you're brought up with that. So that idea that one language holds it all or knows it all is simply not true. And when you know, I quit cre teaching creative writing and would teach translation instead because that way I could tell the, my students, you see, you really think that the language adheres to objects and you try to get that into the poem so that that is right. If you work with different languages, you know that words do not adhere to objects that way. The objects escape, and therefore you have to work with words as the matter of the poem, not some fake relation of the word to the object, or you get wiser by knowing that, you know, uh, um, a tree, an arbre, you know, and is, is, they're not, they're the same, they're not the same. So that, that, that you know, well, I ended with a French word there. <laughs> that might be a wonderful place to stop. Uh, thank you, Pierre and Habib, for a, a really extraordinary evening. Thank you. All right, before we let everyone go, I just wanted to thank all of you again for coming out tonight. Thank you for the International Writing Program and our two uh, wonderful uh, speakers this evening. Uh, we do have plenty of other things to, uh, to come on the festival, but I won't keep you much longer to tell you all of those things. I will just let you know that if you are here in the room, we have schedules over here on the side that you can pick up that list all of the events we have going on. Uh, and if you are watching us from home, uh, iowacitybookfestival.org has all of your schedule and information needs. I will say that the International Writing Program will be back in this room on Friday at noon for uh, their panel discussion. Uh, they have a series of those, and uh, they're gracious enough to let us call their Friday panel during the festival part of our festival. So we're very pleased about that, and I believe Habib is coming back for that. So um, there's more to come there. So again, thank you very much for being here. Our friends at Prairie Lights are in the back of the room. If you would like to uh, purchase uh, books from either of these gentlemen, and if you are watching at home, you can do so at the store or at uh, prairielights.com. So thank you again for coming, and enjoy the rest of your evening. And if you buy the books, we're more than willing to sign them for you. Yes, of course. If you buy your books, you can bring them back up front, and they will be happy to sign. Thank you. <laughs>